So we're going to talk about that. And today I have a real special treat for you. You're not going to hear from me. I'm going to be in the seats, hooping and hollering, shouting amen, clapping like crazy. Because this guy, y'all, listen, this guy can shuck the corn. That means he can preach the paint off the walls. That's, that's preacher speak for this guy can preach. Like, I wish I could preach like this guy. Okay, so... This is Pastor Jason Warman. He's here with his wife, Heidi, all the way from the Florida coast, the beautiful Florida coast. Let's make some noise. A Texas welcome. Come on, Pastor Jason Warman. What's up? Hey, let's give that ovation to Jesus. Come on, could you give Jesus a great hand today? 12, come on, 1230. Let's give God a great praise. So good to see you. You guys can be seated. My name is Jason. I'm pretty fly for a white guy. And I, uh, I'm a Florida man. You may have heard of me. Uh, I'm in the news a lot. I'm just joking. Like, every news article that is like, you know, like somebody does something insanely crazy, it starts off with, in Florida, a Florida man. Didn't... Uh, and so now every time you read the news, you'll think of me. There's the, there's the Florida man without the bath salts, okay? Um, but I, I pastor Coast Life Church in Venice, Florida. Ter- terrible job, but somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to go there and preach the gospel. And uh, I'm here with my lovely wife, Heidi. Say hello, Heidi. This is my beautiful wife. And I'm honored, honored to be with Revolution Church have watched you from afar after getting to know your pastors and uh, it feels like home, feels like family. I know you don't know me, but it feels like family because anytime you step into a church, we serve the same God. There's the same presence of God and I love God's church family. Amen, somebody. And I love, I love your pastors. Do you love your pastors? Pastor Zach, Pastor Andrew. Um, God, God gave you genuine pastors. They're true shepherds. They love people. They love God's house. You know, it's not really challenging to find somebody that'll preach the Bible. It's kind of challenging these days to find somebody who will preach the Bible and live it. And you know what I love about your pastors is they don't just preach it. They live it. They're awesome people. Come on, one more time. Give them a great hand. And I'm going to be in the book of Genesis today, Genesis chapter 1. I'm honored to get to be a a small part of what you're doing this year in in moving God's kingdom forward, and we're moving family forward, and I want to talk about what I believe is the cornerstone of the family, and that is I want to talk about marriage. I want to talk about understanding God's design for men and women, and we're going to talk about moving God's kingdom forward in our marriages and in our lives. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, the Bible says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Notice that, in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps. Creeper's going to creep, y'all. That's what they do. Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image image. There it is again. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. God put a blessing on them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I I love to give titles to messages if you take notes, or uh, I I think it helps people remember things. I want to preach a message today called Pictures of Grace. And, And in the 1760s, there was a man named John Salisbury, and he he made maps and was the inventor of Salisbury steak. I'm just joking. He didn't do that. It was Salisbury. It's like steak, but not. Not good at all. And I'm always hesitant to make jokes like that because as soon as you say that, somebody would be like, my great-grandfather invented Salisbury steak. And you're like, I'm so sorry I offended you, but your grandfather created something that's not good. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's like steak, but it's not. It's a hamburger that's drowning gravy. And... 
if you're going to eat steak. There's other options. There's T-bone, there's ribeye, there's filet. There's, there's just a lot of, okay, none of that is biblical. Let's, uh, in the 1760s, John Salisbury was a map maker, and he was wanting to teach kids geography. And so he took a map, and he glued it to a very thin piece of wood, and then he cut out all the countries. And so he would use, have kids put the map back together. And as they would, as they would put the pieces together, the world would come together. And what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna talk to you about today is if you'll put the pieces God has given you, your, your world will come together. And it's, it's actually where we get our jigsaw puzzle from. And he invented the jigsaw puzzle. And in Genesis chapter one, this is God giving us a complete picture for marriage and human sexuality. Genesis chapter one, it's, it's a complete picture of what God has for humanity. And if you, if you didn't know this, or maybe I think sometimes we just need to re- be reminded of things that people have already told us in our lives, but you're made in the image of God that you, you are the Imago Dei. You are made in the image of God. And not, not only does that mean God shaped you, but God actually breathed the breath of life into you. You're, you're breathing borrowed breath, breath from, the, breath from the Almighty. And when God breathed into you, he breathed into you the breath of life, which means now you have a soul. Now you have a spirit. Now you have a will. Now you have thoughts. I don't know if you've ever thought about your thoughts, but only humanity can take something picture it in their minds, look at it from multiple angles, contemplate it, examine it. It's the gift of God. You have the ability to articulate and to communicate. All of those things are the, are the image and the reflection of God. And Genesis chapter 1 shows us this perfect picture that both sexes came out of God. Both male and female came from God that you carry the likeness of God. And when we talk about both men and women, a lot of times people think, well, it was for companionship, and that's true. God did give us companionship in this world, but it's not just about companionship, that both male and female came from God. And I know that woman was taken out of the side of man, but that does not mean that you came from man. You still came from God. You were you were sourced from God. And I want to give you a, just a few thoughts on on. God's pictures, God's pictures for marriage, God's picture for our own personal identity. And number one is this, and that is God is a really good designer. God designs good things, y'all. He, he designs things that, that are good. In fact, God is the designer of every good thing that we see. If you see something good, really good, genuinely good, God designed it. Every good and perfect thing comes down from the Father of light, with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And that we need to understand that there are things that are on earth that are a reflection of heaven. That just because we see it on earth doesn't mean it's earthly. There are some things that we see on earth that are sourced in heaven. That, that we need to locate where they come from because there are things that appear on earth, but, but they're, they're actually sourced in heaven. And what God does is God comes into our lives and he gives us a vision. He gives us a picture. This, this is what I can do. This is my plans. This, these, these are the purposes that I have for your life. Through his word, God gives us a vision. And when God gives you a picture, what God is giving you is a promise. Because if God is showing it to you, it's a promise from God that he can give it to you, that it can be a part of your life. And, and our, our job as believers is to live on this earth, but to receive a design that isn't earthly, it's heavenly. And our job is to break off the patterns of the world so that we can follow the design of the creator and seek out what his plan is for our lives. And then we get, we, we get in this tension of we're living in an earthly plane, but we want to live by a heavenly reality, which means we need to make decisions that just because something may be legally right doesn't mean that it's spiritually right. That, <laughs> that, it's, that it doesn't matter if it's culturally appropriate, it may not be kingdom appropriate. Yeah. That it's not about what's right in the eyes of man. Come on, it's about what's right in the eyes of God. And then the culture will try to you know, tell you what's, 
acceptable and unacceptable and try to tell you to, what you should do. But here's, here's what I want you to understand is that it's, it's God's design and only God's design that leads to reward. That, that leads you to the place. God's design leads to blessing and abundance. And, and the patterns of the world, what they do is they always offer freedom of choice. Like there, it just seems like there's so many more choices if you follow the, the pattern of the world. But the problem is that you have freedom of choice, but it always takes you to a place of bondage. But the design of God, how many of you know that he's a one-way God? Like there's a one. There's there's just a right way. There's a, there's. I've got a design for your life. If you'll follow the design, and people are like, that's so restrictive. I'll let her, I'd rather have choice. Yeah, that choice is going to lead you to bondage. But that narrow path, Jesus said, there's a narrow road and there's few that find it. But you know what? The narrow path leads to broad places. Every time that you find the way of God, it's going to take you to a place of abundance. <laughs> and God's complete picture for humanity was that there would be both male and female sexes that he, he didn't make a mistake when he made man. When he made you a man, God knew what he was doing. We need, we need to celebrate masculinity. God didn't... <laughs> I, I like the 1230 crowd. I have, I have extremely low self-esteem and, and struggle from crippling insecurity. And so when I preach, I need constant affirmation, just constant, just constant. At the amen. That's so good. That's the greatest thing I've ever heard. You're so handsome. I'm just throwing, throwing ideas out to you. You say what, whatever you want to say. I'm just trying to help you. But God, God didn't make a mistake. Listen, men, you're not toxic. You're a gift from God. God, God made you. And if you've ever wondered, like, God, God didn't make you to be like other men. God made you to be like him. So stop comparing your masculinity to other people's masculinity and just know that you're made in the image of God. God didn't make a mistake when he made women. Women weren't secondary. They weren't an afterthought. You're not a second-class citizen. You're not weak, and you're nobody's property. You're a unique creation of a good God, and God has plans for you. He didn't, and he not only did he not make a mistake when he made women, he didn't make a mistake when he made you a woman. He had a plan for your life, and his plan for your life is not that you would try to look like other women. Come on, that you would look like the God who made you, that you would find your image in him. And we need, we need both men and women in our lives. We need women, men and women in church. We need men and women in our families, in our lives, because our identity is part of God's plan. It's part of God's purpose. And God's plan was that, that men and women would be together, that there, that there would be a togetherness. And, and the Bible says that, that marriage, the, the relationship between man and woman, that it's blessed. God said he, he made them and then he blessed him. Here, here's the picture is when you get a healthy identity and you step into a marriage that God has designed, then God has already put his blessing on it. So can I give you a picture today? Here's the formula that I've given, and that is you plus me equals blessed. You plus me equals blessed. That, that when we step into the design that God has, that it's a picture that God is showing us, a picture of that, that God wants to reign over the world through the relationship between men and women by, by them multiplying and him being, them being blessed and walking in dominion. And dominion means simply uh, to build a world that is suitable and enjoyable to humanity. That, that God gave the couple, God gave the two of them dominion over the earth. And we live in a chaotic world. We live in a world that has chaos. It's full of chaos. There's full of, uh, there's full of, ins of, of insanity. But God gave us a, a, a relationship that together we could go out and the world still may be chaotic, but we're building a life together that is full of the blessing of God because it's under the design of God. And God's given us the ability, come on, to have dominion and reign and experience the blessing of God. And your marriage is an image. It's an image of God, which is why the enemy is always trying to attack your marriage. I mean, like in, in a general sense in our culture, marriage is under attack. But even in a personal sense, you have to know that the enemy has a target on your marriage. And it's because the enemy wants to destroy the image of God on the earth today. 
And did you know that your marriage is actually a picture of something? The Apostle Paul said that your marriage is a picture of Christ and the church that your marriage is a picture of God's covenant with us, that through us, through the church, that God is going to reign on this earth and that Satan is going to be defeated and the church through Jesus is going to be victorious and be the ones that lead into the future. That's why the enemy wants to destroy you because your marriage reminds him of what's going to destroy him. And he, it reminds him every time he sees you that you are walking in victory over him and you may be struggling today, and I, I don't know where your marriage is at, if it's in a good place or a bad place, but I just want to tell you, you're doing a little bit better than you think you are, because every time the enemy receives you, he sees Christ in the church, and he remembers, I'm defeated, and that's God's kingdom, that's God's plan moving forward. Come on, somebody. When you live under the design of God, it's a place that's blessed. When you flourish in your identity, when, when you begin to embrace who God created you to be, it's God's kingdom moving forward. It's God's design. It's, it, it's, it's God's kingdom moving forward. We, we, we've taken it for, we, it's been so much a part of our world, we've taken it for granted. But when you embrace who God created you to be, when you embrace the design that God put on the earth, it's God's kingdom going forward and it's darkness getting driven out. It's, it's the brokenness of the world getting driven out. And that's why the enemy wants to destroy it. And that's Genesis chapter one. God said, I'm going to create a man. I'm going to create a woman. I want them to go have dominion. I want them to multiply. I want them to have children. And I'm going to give them dominion. And I'm going to put a blessing on it. And Genesis chapter one is the picture. And then Genesis chapter two is the enemy. It's Satan, the inventor of Salisbury steak. <laughs> coming as a serpent, telling lies and destroying the picture God gave them. And Genesis chapter 2 gives us a picture of a world that's broken. So God's word says, I'm going to give you a complete design. But now we come into the world broken. We come into this world broken. broken. And what happens is we, we get given a box of just disconnected pieces. There's, there's our own personal identity. There's our desires. There's our image our choices, just a box of disconnected pieces. The world is broken. We're broken. And here's what I found out for a lot of us. We get handed our piece before we even know what our pieces are for. We, we get so much of, so many of us were handed these pieces before we even knew what this picture was about. And we, we didn't know that, that these things were something God was wanting to do in our lives. And what happens is we allow the enemy to convince us that because we're broken, the picture is broken. And can I just tell you, you, marriage isn't broken. Family isn't broken. There's nothing wrong with marriage. Your, your marriage isn't broken. Your marriage has two broken people in it. And the thing we need to do is not destroy marriage. The thing we need to do is fix the two broken people in the marriage so we can have God's picture. Your family isn't broken. Oh, man, you don't know my family. My family's broken. No, your family has a lot of broken people in it. We don't need to destroy the family. We just need to start putting the pieces together so we can experience God's best for our lives. God, God didn't make a mistake when he created you. And what happens is, the enemy, God wants to give you this vision. The enemy wants this to become an identity. He, he wants the brokenness, like the, the, the confusion in the image of who God created you. He wants that to become your identity. The, the, the broken desires that we have that go beyond the picture God gave us. He's like, no, 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 no. That's not who you are. This is who you are. That's who you are. And what happens is we have to reject something. We either have to reject the design of God and stay in our brokenness, or we have to make a decision, I'm going to reject my brokenness, and I'm going to believe for the design that God has for my life. Is there's a choice in acknowledging that I am not the designer, I am not the one that chooses my design, that God is the one that does it. In fact, there's a choice that is made, Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 29, the message version. Paul records this. He says, since they didn't bother, watch this, to acknowledge God, 
God quit bothering them and let them run loose, and then all hell broke loose, rampant evil, grabbing and grasping, vicious backstabbing. Here's what Paul is saying, is that if you want to reject and not acknowledge that God is your designer, that he created you, that he has a plan for your life, then God will let you live in the brokenness. He will say, if that's what you want, I'll stop bothering you. I'll stop visiting you with my grace. I'll stop sending my spirit to convict you when you fall down or when you're wrong. I'll, I'll just, I'll, 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 I'll withdraw from your life. If that's what you want, I'll respect your desires. I'll let you live in that identity. But if you'll acknowledge God, God says, I'll stay right there with you. And I just want to encourage somebody because I think sometimes people feel like struggling is a sign of losing. And I just want to tell you, struggling is a sign of winning. It means that you are wrestling with yourself, but you're holding on to God's plan. And you're saying, I may have made a mistake, but I'm not living in that mistake. I'm going to trust that God's grace is going to pick me up. And if you're struggling, I just want to give you some advice. Just keep struggling. Just don't, don't quit acknowledging that God is the one that has good plans for your life. Don't let this become an identity and quit acknowledging that God has better plans and a better purpose for your life. And if you're struggling, just keep struggling because I'll make you this promise. If you won't give up on God, God absolutely will not give up on you. He will be faithful every step of the way that every time you fall, God will help you get back up. Every time you trip, you'll find that there's grace for your life. Every time that you're not faithful, you'll find out God is more faithful than we are. He is faithful to our lives. He's not looking for perfection. He's just looking for people who will just keep saying, God, you've got good plans. I know I failed, but I'm going to get back up and I'm going to keep trusting your grace. I'm going to keep trusting the plan that you have for my life. I know it sounds weird, but if you're struggling, keep struggling. Thank God for the struggle. It means there's life. It means that there's God's plan still in your life, that God hasn't just said you can have it, that God's still with you. How do we move forward in our lives? I think it's really simple, and it's just to live under a simple reality. And that is not, number two is this, is that Jesus is king. I don't, I don't know what Kanye's posting right now, but I just know that he was right when he said this one, okay? This one was right. <laughs> Jesus is king. You know, every, most everyone knows the Lord's Prayer. Our, our, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. I want you to think about that kingdom. How many of you know there is a king? There's the kingdom of the world and there's the kingdom of God. Jesus taught us a daily prayer was to pray, your kingdom come, watch this, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. What is our job as believers today? Our job as believers is to stand on the earth and pull heaven's design down into our earth reality. That's, that's, that's our job. To use the tools God gave us, our faith, to believe for things, our trust, and we'll depend on God's word, our obedience, and we'll obey God's word. I'm not going to live by that reality of the world. I'm going to pull the design of heaven into my earthly reality. And we live in a problematic age when people believe that you can live however you want to live and still experience the blessing of God. And this is a little strong my first time here. Hopefully this won't get me uninvited from ever coming back to Revolution Church, but how many of you know that you can believe in God but not experience the blessing of God? That believing in God doesn't necessarily mean you're going to experience the blessing of God. Because blessing is the byproduct of living a God-designed life. Because I'm going I'm I'm to step, there's, God's got designs. If I'll be a generous person, if I live by God's plan, design for money, I'll experience blessing. If I live by God's design for family, for marriage, I'll, I'll, I'll experience blessing because dominion and blessing are already on the designs that God has given us. Like a lot of people think that blessing is mysterious, right? Like it's just you, you pull God's lucky lever of faith and 777 pops up and somebody gets blessed over here. And, you know, it's like, you know, it's just I wasn't standing in the right spot, right? I should, that person was standing. I should have been standing there and somehow mystically blessing would have found my life. Listen, blessing isn't mystical. Blessing is following the design that God has for your life. It's, it's taking these pieces like God, God made me and I'm not going to reject God and create an identity that is apart from him. 
I'm going to receive the identity that God gave me. And then I'm going to take that identity and I'm going to acknowledge God. And by acknowledging God, I'm beginning a relationship with him, a relationship of trust and dependence. And then through that trust and dependence as a single person, I'm going to honor God by saving sex for marriage. And then when God brings somebody into my life, I'm going to build a covenant marriage with God and this person. And then I'm going to take that relationship and I'm going to find a spiritual faith family and I'm going to get planted in God's house. House, and I'm going to raise my children in the house of God, and I'm going to tithe and be faithful, and I'm going to serve and be generous. You know what you're doing? You're just putting the picture together of walking out the blessing that God has for your life. It's all of these things. We're broken. The world's broken. Come on, God's picture's not broken. Well, when you put it together, when you put the pieces together, the, the, the dominion, the blessing is coming together. And that's, that's why the Bible calls Esau immoral. Is because God had given him all of these, all, all of these blessings. And, and he traded it away for something that was so fleeting and temporary. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 16 says this. And this is what we need to hear in our culture today. Watch out for the Esau syndrome trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. You well know how Esau later regretted that impulsive act and wanted God's blessing, but by then it was too late. Tears are no tears. Here's what I will encourage you. Don't trade away the blessing of obedience for the bondage of choice. You can make any choice you want to make. The world will offer you choices. But just because it's a choice doesn't mean that it's freedom. Freedom is the product of following the design that God has for your life. It always leads to a place of design and obedience. And freedom isn't having the multitude of choices to say, I can live my life. I can make my choices. I can, I can choose who I am apart from God. I can choose my plan for my life. No, you know what freedom is? Freedom is saying, I'm not, gonna, I'm not the Lord of my life. The world is not going to be the Lord of my life. There's only one king. His name is Jesus. I'm going to live under his reign. I'm going to live under his rule. Come on. And when I live under the reign of Jesus, I'm victorious. I'm blessed. I have dominion. And it's always, it's always interesting to me because the world claims to be very accepting. And I found out it's actually very limiting. The world will only accept you if you will identify with their form of brokenness. But if you try to live by God's design, the world will actually cancel you. And our brokenness then becomes an identity. It becomes... A, we think it's a part of us. Listen, you may have made a mistake. You're not a mistake. A moment is not an identity. An event is not an identity. An experience is not an identity. And our broke, but our brokenness becomes our identity. And listen, part of our our process, of what we would call sanctification, a spiritual growth is, is looking less like the world has told us to be and look more like what Jesus has called us to be. But our brokenness becomes an identity. But how many of you know that's the power of the gospel? Is that Jesus came to redeem the broken. He came to redeem broken people. But what happens is we, we get so fragmented that not only are we in pieces, but we get broken. We make decisions that, that fragment our identity, that, that begin to change the course of our life. We feel like we're so fragmented. And here's what the enemy tells you, is you're so broken that this will never be possible in your life. And here's what Jesus says, I don't care how broken you are, I can still redeem the picture and the vision that I have for your life, that there's nothing you've done, there's nothing you've done that's changed the plans that I have for you or changed the vision I have for your life, that God still has great things because how many of you know Jesus can put the pieces back together again? In Ephesians 2.10, Paul says this. He says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Here's the third part of this I want to give you is that in Christ, you're a masterpiece, not a mistake. That outside of Christ, there's the brokenness. There, it becomes an identity. But in Christ, we believe that we were designed by God, that we were created by God, 
and God had good plans and a good design. And when we come to Christ, we step into a place where we are becoming what God has intended for us to be all along. And I love that word masterpiece because in the, in the Greek, it's the, word, it's the word poema. And it's actually where we get our word poem from. And it literally means a work of art. But more specifically, it's not just a work of art. It's, it's when an artist creates their masterpiece, like their lifetime work. It, it, it's interesting because it would be, it would be like when a, we call it getting in, a, getting in the zone. I, I love sports. I watch a lot of sports. It's always amazing to watch when an athlete gets what we call in the zone. It's like for that, that brief time, they can do no wrong. They're just at, at a higher level. Well, that's what it's talking about. It means when the, when the artist was creating something, he was in the zone. So this wasn't just a work. It was his best work. And I don't know if you know it or not, but when God made you, he didn't do haphazard work. You were the best work God could do. You, you were God's masterpiece. You were God's masterpiece. And Jesus came. Jesus came. So it doesn't matter how broken or messed up this is, that we would have the choice to say we may have come into the, broke, the world broken in a million pieces, but by faith we're building the vision God has for our lives. And it doesn't matter how broken it is, God is the one that can put it back together again. And God did not make a mistake. You are not a mistake. God knew what he was doing when he made you a man, that he didn't make you a man and then try to figure out what to do with you. God had a plan before you had a, before you had a pulse. God had a purpose for you before you had a pulse. God knew exactly who you should be, and he made you exactly who he wanted you to be. God made you a woman. You were not an accident. It's not incidental. God didn't make you and then try to figure out what to do with you. God knew exactly who you need to be because he had a place for you in this world. He had something that he wanted you to do, something that he wanted you to be. God made you for marriage. God made you for man, for family, and God made you for blessing, and God made you for dominion. And I promise you this, I promise you this, that if you'll just believe and trust in the desire of God. I know the world doesn't encourage you to do that. I know oftentimes the brokenness of our humanity doesn't encourage us to trust the promises of God, but I promise you, if you'll just trust the design of God, that someday you'll step back and you'll look around your life and you'll see the family that God has given you and you'll see the spouse that God has given you and you'll see the children that you're getting the opportunity to raise up in the house of God to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When you look around and you see the church that God's given you, that's leading people into God's grace, that when you look around, you'll be able to say, all I see are pictures of God's grace. All I see are pictures of the grace of God. Some of you are already in a place in your life where you're watching your children walk out their purpose and their calling, and you just step back and realize, it wasn't my goodness, and it wasn't my plans, and it wasn't me that made it happen. These are pictures of the grace of God. Some of us are in places, I'm in a season of my life where it's not because I was so good. God knows I've failed a thousand times. God knows that I've fallen more times than I care to count. But with his grace, he just picks us up and I look over my life and I just see pictures of the grace of God. I promise you. I promise you, God paints good pictures. God tells good stories. God does good things. And it's not that the world is perfect. It's not. But when you're in the design of God, you can believe that God's going to do good things and that you can have dominion. I'm in the design of God. So there's a mountain, but I'm going to speak to the mountain and tell it to be removed. I'm in a place where there seems to be no way, but I believe God can part the Red Sea in your life and make a way where there seems to be no way. That you may be facing some things in your life, but if you're in the design, of God. God has good things for you. You trust in the blessing and you walk in dominion and whatever you face with men, it may be impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Come on, stand on your feet. Give God some praise. It's a picture. God gives us pictures in his word, pictures of his plans. They're not social construct, they're kingdom design. We don't have to, we don't even have to perfectly do them. We just have to imperfectly do them and let God's grace work it out. But just stay in a place of faith and trust. If you're in a struggle, stay in the struggle. God's with you in the struggle. He'll never leave you, He'll never forsake you, He'll never abandon you. He'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. If you're struggling in your identity, just keep struggling. I know it sounds weird, but don't give up on God. 
Don't give up on him as a good designer. He cares about every detail of your life. He's going to do good things in your life. You receive that today, Revolution Church. Would you give Jesus some praise? I want to pray for you really quickly. I just want to give a moment. Because I, I don't think you can love yourself until you know the love of God. I don't think you can know yourself until you know the God that created you. I just, in this moment, in this, I feel the presence of God in this room. In a moment like this, this is what the Bible would call the spirit of adoption. Like, why, why is the atmosphere of this room different than any other room? It's because the presence of the living God is in this room. And it's because the spirit of adoption is in this place. What does that mean? Is that means you may not be a part of the family of God, but the Holy Spirit is moving through this room right now, giving you an invitation to become a child of God. You're like, man, I, what do I need to do? You don't need to do anything. It's already done through Jesus. You need to receive. And today, I know these are, these are church phrases. You're like, you don't know what I was doing last night, this weekend. You know what? After this prayer, you know what you're going to call yourself? You're going to call yourself man of God. You're going to call yourself woman of God. You're going to call yourself child of God. Not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus has done. Come on, I want to pray. I want to pray for somebody to receive Jesus to make this decision. My desires are not king. My choices are not king. This world is not king. Jesus is king. And we'll give you an opportunity today just to follow Jesus. Come on, I want, every, I want the whole church family. Everybody say this prayer with me. Somebody's going to pray it from their heart. This is their moment to begin a relationship with Jesus or recommit their life to Jesus. But can the whole church family stand with them in this moment? Let's say this together. Say this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my past. Wash away my sin. Make me a new person. Today I receive you as my leader and my Lord. And I'll never be the same in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Could you give Jesus a great praise? Here's what I, I want to do is I just want to give an, a moment for somebody to make a confession. You know, the Bible talks about believing in your heart. That's what we just did. That it talks about confessing with your mouth. Come on, can we turn this moment into a declaration that today I've decided to follow Jesus. Today I've recommitted my life to Jesus. Today old things are passed away and behold, new things have begun. Today the past is gone and my future has begun. Can we declare today that eternity is different because of this 1230 service because somebody's name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Can we declare today that, that legacy is changing, that, that generations of faith are beginning in this moment right now. I love to give a moment of clarity, of confidence. I'm going to count to three. If you just prayed that prayer with me, when I get to three, just shoot your hand up and say, Jason, I prayed that prayer today. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm recommitting my life. Come on, can we let a little faith rise in the room, believing for, some, for this to be somebody's day of decision on the count of three? One, Two, come on, if that was you, three. Would you just raise your hand all over the room today and say today is better? Come on, I see those hands, hands going up all over this room. That's incredible. Come on, heaven looks a little bit different right now. Say welcome to the family of God.